I'm Michael DiPietro, and uh, Father Tony has asked me to discuss the relationship of justice and suffering. When you, talk, when you link justice and suffering together, you're implying that there's evil, because justice implies right and wrong, righteousness and sin. And evil is, not, is, is manifests itself in three different ways. First, there's ontological evil. That's the evil that we, we, that's Satan, that's the demons, that's the spiritual world, the malevolent personalities, intelligence that's trying to destroy us. The second evil is natural evil. We see that all the time when we see disease, plagues, earthquakes, volcanoes. This is also a great evil. St. Paul talks about how nature itself is groaning for salvation. And in, in Genesis, it talks about how it, the earth became formless and void. It, it, the actual term being used there in, in the Hebrew is, is intrinsically chaotic, based on uh, coming out of a good, era, good world. The third evil is moral evil. We're all very familiar with that. That's when we basically say no to God and, and exercise our free will against his perfect order. And moral, we call that sin. Now, when we talk about moral evil, there's two kinds, two steps. There's personal evil, the, the sin that I commit between me and God that needs to be confessed. And then there's the social. Most people forget that all sin is social. I cannot possibly sin. I cannot, like, say a bad thing about you without affecting not just you, but everybody around you. It's like a ripple effect that affects all of society. All sin is social. So when you, when you go to confession, when the priest is absolving you, he's absolving you in the name of the body of Christ because you've sinned against the entire body of Christ. And, and you can't go to every single person in the world and ask for forgiveness. You can't go to heaven and talk to the to our infant church and ask for forgiveness, or the suffering church in the purgatory and ask for forgiveness. So every time when you see things go wrong in the world and bad things happen, it's because all the personal choices that people are making that violate God's will and order is like a cancer that spreads through the entire social fabric and creates this chaotic, evil design trying to destroy us. Now, sin is, believe it or not, not just a principle or an act. If you study scripture, it is also a personification. In Galatians chapter 4, verse, verse uh, 6 and 7, God is talking to Cain. You remember the story of Cain? Cain was jealous of Abel and was wanted to murder him. And, and, and God says, what's your problem? Go read it. Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. If you do what is right, won't everything be okay? But if you don't do what is right, sin, like a person, is lurking at your door, seeking to control you, to take, to take over you, and you must master it. St. Peter, in the first letter of Peter, talks about uh, the devil being like a prowling lion, going about seeking whom he can devour. And Paul, in Romans chapter 6 and 7, those entire two chapters, talk about the principle of law of sin and death, which he, he, he talks about it as a personified evil that basically keeps us from doing what is good and makes us do things we don't want to do. So you, we have an enemy. Jesus confronted that enemy, and in, 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 if you remember in the Gospels, when he, um, uh, in the desert, when he went out in the desert, and Lucifer tempted him in all these different ways. And, and there, remember too, the last temptation, Jesus, uh, Satan said to, to Jesus, if you just worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms, the kingdom of this world. What is that telling you? When Adam fell, he ceded his authority and, and of, this, of this planet, of this earth, and gave it to Satan. Satan is prince of this world. So when you see all these terrible things going on in the world, whether they be wars, whether they be earthquakes, whether it be disease, he's behind it all. He hates us very much and wants to destroy us. What's, the only thing that keeps it from becoming totally an abyss and horrible hell here on earth 
is the grace of God. The restrainer, as it talks about in 1 Timothy, that the restrainer of the Holy Spirit keeps Satan from going overboard. But he still is the prince of this world. Keep that in mind. So when things happen to you, you get very sick, or, 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 or you, your house collapses for an earthquake, um, or, or, uh, uh, you feel, or you feel uh, spiritual attacks. This is, not, this is not God willing it. This is, this is Satan exercising his control and his dominion. Does that mean God has no power over this? Absolutely not. God puts us in, gives us a choice. In Deuteronomy 28 and Deuteronomy 30, he lays down spiritual laws that even Satan has to obey. And uh, you either can choose life or you can choose death. I strongly recommend, even tonight, look up, read, it's a long chapter, but it's so detailed. And it tells you what we are destined to do and be. If we choose death, all these curses will come upon us. If we choose life, all these blessings will come upon us. This is true for Christians and non-Christians. This is a spiritual law like gravity. If I fall off a, a, the roof of a building, don't expect me to fly away. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crash in the ground. That's a law. And these are spiritual laws. And, and um, if he, it talks about Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. It talks about what you sow, you shall reap. I ask you to take a look at that passage tonight and read and discuss it. This is a spiritual law. It has nothing to do with, uh, with, with um, personal choices uh, by God or Satan. This is how it works. Now, how do we overcome this? Well, Romans, Romans 8, verse 28, talks about how all things work together for the good, for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Many people read this and don't really look at it carefully. It says, you can love God and still not live according to His purpose. Living according to His, to his purpose is to live and, and following, as Jesus did, to His Father's will. Jesus, over and over and over again, the Gospels talked about how He is not performing His will, but His Father's will. And He said, even as, I, as the Father sent me, now I send you. Our job is to know what God's will is and to live in it and to do that out of our love for Him. When we do that, His blessings will, and, his, and His covering will be upon you. It's not as simple as I'm putting it in, in the next talk, I'll get into it in more detail. The point is, theologically speaking, that we either put ourselves under His protection and under His control or we don't. We can't have it both ways. We can't be living our own lives our own way and say, God, where are you? You, you know, God's going to let you exercise your free will and to do things that lead to certain consequences. But what happens when somebody does a morally evil act and it affects me? Just the other night, um, Saturday, last Saturday night, it's 2 a.m. in the morning, not far from my house, these uh, six kids coming from a prom uh, were driving 120 miles per hour and they crashed and three kids died and three ended up in the hospital. Now, they, they were, the driver and many of the other passengers were drunk. Uh, so here we have, and, and it's such a tragedy, just, it's a horrible, but whose fault is that? Well, I'm sure there's going to be some parents who are going to say, why was my daughter or my son in that car at that time with this person? Why couldn't God have prevented that? And, and of course, the driver himself, why did he drive drunk? You know, the point of me pointing this out is the drunk driver committed moral acts that not only affected him, but the lives of five other people. That's not God's will or God's purpose. This is what happens when people live outside of God's purpose, control, in, in design. What we are to is called to be faithful servants, to live under His blessings, under His protection. And then the, on our next talk, we're going to talk about redemptive suffering, how when aff affliction comes to us, God will bring His grace, His purpose, and turn a terrible thing into a great victory. 
The best example of that is the crucifixion. Satan's greatest triumphant moment became his greatest defeat. So I'm going to leave you with three questions. First question, discuss briefly your personal experiences with the reality of evil. Some of you might have had more, um, per, uh, more uh, personal experiences than others. I'm not asking you to get into a long, detailed discussion, but share that you, did, that you have a common reality of this evil in your life and how it, how it affected you. The um, second question, share examples or instances in your life where you feel God blessed you in times of trouble. I know in my personal life I can give an hours of, 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 of stories of how God, you know, took me out of the darkness into his marvelous light. And how he, it says in Psalm 48 that God is a very present strength in times of trouble. And the third question, I want you to read together Galatians 6, 7 through 9. It talks about you reap what you sow. This is one of those spiritual laws. It, tack, it goes back to Deuteronomy 28 and Deuteronomy 30. You have a lot of control of what happens in your life if you obey this, this spiritual law. Read it and discuss it amongst yourselves and, and how this seems or seems not to be true. The, my last thought to you is God really, really loves you. He died on the cross for this purpose, to destroy evil, to destroy the suffering in this world that evil brings. And never, never leave, never, never doubt even in your darkest moments, how much he will die for you again. Thank you. God bless you.